You know, it's the same way here, like we said last week, is that we are, in essence, preparing for something in the future. Uh, because it is going to happen. And if you don't believe it's going to happen, you need to ask yourself why and rethink what you're doing with your life. Because there is going to come a day that you die. There is going to come a day either that you die or the second coming of Jesus comes. We don't know which one's going to happen first. So you need to be prepared. We are preparing ourselves. And there is an urgency on this because we don't know the day or the time. So you should always be in preparation for these things. So I gave you the nine topics that you can write some notes in there. These will be our categories for next Sunday. It'll be like, uh, I'll probably, you'll have the question, I'll choose a category, I'll tell you what category it's from, and then I'll read the question. Last time I let you choose categories, but it kind of took too long, because it took too long to try to decide which category to choose, so I won't do that. I'll just choose the category for you. But I'll tell you what the category is, and then the question, that way it kind of helps you zero in what the answer might be. So the first one is God's designs for the family. That's just the introduction to the other eight things that we did. And so there, first thing we have to understand on uh, the beginning and introduction to anything like God's design for anything, especially the family, is that what is, what is a family? How did it all start? What's a family supposed to be? Where did things go wrong if they did? So first thing you have to understand is, first of all, in the beginning, God, just like I said. And what does it say in the beginning with God? It says in the beginning God created what? Male and female. Doesn't say God created a bunch of organisms and y'all can decide for yourself what you want to be. It's not in scripture anywhere. That's a man-made construct. So the Bible says very distinctly, this is the way it is. We know that from science. You know, a lot of people think that science and the Bible contradict. They do not. Because we know without a fact that science, that everybody has a genetic code. You cannot change your genetic code. And so God has created you very unique. You know, you are very special. You're not an accident, like I said earlier. God's design for the family is specifically to understand that he created the family for a reason, and that is to worship him and to be with him. You can see that in the book of Genesis. Everything I say this morning is very important. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. It's not going to be on the test, basically, so that's your clue. So in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26 through 31 talks very specifically about God's basically genetic code and how he designed the family. We have two world, we have two views, two ways that people live their life. Basically, you can pull everything down, everybody down into two ways how they live their life. One is they're going to live it for themselves, or they're going to live it for God. And there's really no, there's no other category. Because if you're not living it for God, you're living it for yourself. You can say, well, Steve, there's other people who have other religions and all this. That's true. Those other religions, though, if they're not Christianity, if they're not the biblical worldview, then they're not living for God. They'll live for themselves. There's a lot of religions, and most, well, all, over, all over the religions, except for uh, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith, are man-made constructs. I mean, go back and look at it. Look at their history. Some guy did this. Some guy did that. Some people did this. Some people did that. We created this list of things. If you're a Buddhist... You're following a bunch of rules and regulations that are trying to get you to, to you know, a nirvana type situation where you don't uh, have any problems anymore. This is never going to exist. There's two worldviews. There's two views in the world, two ways that you live your life. The worldview, also called the secular view, who's, in, who's the authority in that? Who makes the decisions? Yourself. You, yourself, and if, if you let, those, let Satan in, he's going to throw you off course a lot on things. So if you're, if you're looking to any other authority other than God in your life and his commands, because like if your child, God says, obey your parents. I mean, you can't tell your parents, I can't, I can't obey you because I got to obey God. Well, at that point, they're one and the same because God says, children, obey your parents. So if you're not obeying God and his commands and following Jesus, then you're, you're doing your own thing. You're doing yourself. So there's basically a secular view, which is the authority itself, the biblical view, which the authority is God. So you can always ask yourself, you know, when you meet anybody, and you can say, what are their authority is? Who do they look to to make decisions in life? So there's two, basically you can pull everything down to two categories, a secular view and the Christian view. One has God as the authority, the other one has self. 
Now, you take that in consideration also, and we're looking towards, forward to how does this influence the way that you talk and teach other people. First of all, you have to understand that how you parent mostly has a lot to do with how you were parented. Those parents have a lot to do, how they parent had a lot to do with how they were parented, and so on and so on and so on. So there is, you cannot escape the chain of the past. You can't escape it. It's there for you. Now what you do with it is another thing entirely. You have to understand that these, these things are always going to come at you. Anytime you're talking about parenting and how to raise people and God's design for the family, there's always going to be outside influences. Now you can break the chain of dysfunction by honoring God in your family. You can start that today. You can start that next day. You can start that any time and saying, I'm going to break this chain of selfishness. And in the second worldview, we're going to start honoring God. But you still have those pressures in the past. They're always going to be there, but it's not an excuse. You can't say, well, my parents did bring me up like that, so I'm not going to do that. So you can't, that's not an excuse anymore. Then you can't blame it on anybody else. Number two, where are you headed? So this goes right along with this. This is... This is kind of like part two of the intro. So, we, so where have we come from? God has, has designed us. Where are we headed? That's the next question we have to ask ourselves. Always. Everybody's always either coming somewhere or going somewhere. You're always headed somewhere. You're not on earth by accident. You need to know where you came from, where you're headed. There's three scriptures that are very vital to telling us what the Christian worldview is, what the Christian view is about where you're headed, where you're going. That's 1 Peter 1, 7. I want you to write it down if you want to. I'm trying to go too fast for you. 1 Peter 1, 7, in summary, says, we're called to be different. You know, who am I? Where am I headed? You're called to be different. When you talk to people that aren't Christians, they're going to have a different, entirely uh, different plan and structure for their lives because they're headed to a different place. And you may feel like an outsider sometimes. You may feel different. That's okay. The Bible says expect that. When you're in school, you may be the only person in your class that has been saved and is trying to be a, to be a Christian. You may, feel, you may feel like an outsider. That's okay. You are. <coughs> because in Peter, 1 Peter says, live as outsiders because you don't want to be involved in what they're involved in. Uh, second scripture there is Job 8, 9. Job 8, 9 talks about we are headed to a destination in the future. And I want you to remember how quick that destination goes. And I know about you, the older you get, the faster life goes by. Remember when you were a child and it seemed like forever for Christmas to come along. You're like, when is it Christmas yet? When is it happening? It just takes forever to get here. And now I'm like, didn't we just have Christmas last month? <laughs> Wait, that was like six months ago. I mean, now, you know, when you get older, you have a lot to do, a lot of mind, a lot of things to do. And time goes by really fast. Well, the Bible actually says that life goes by fast. And Job 8 and 9, it basically says life goes by like a shadow that disappears. You look at your shadow. Oh, it's gone. It's, oh, it's gone. That's how fast your shadow disappears. That's life. It goes like that. Philippians. 3, 20 and 21. It says who we are, where are we headed? The theme there, where are you headed? Philippians 3, 20 and uh, 21 talks about how we are citizens of heaven. You are called out. You are different. We are going to work in a different way than other people do. And also that your citizenship in heaven cannot be taken away. You cannot lose your salvation once the God has sealed you in. This is not anything that you could lose. So that's kind of part two. Number three. Some of these titles help you out with it too. Education, opposition, and answers. Education, opposition, and answers. If you remember, that's where I had one of my friends videoed his uh, decisions with his family that are trying to make about what to do with their kids the upcoming school year. He was like, I don't know. We do, want to, we do want to educate our kids, you know, with the Christian view. But how do we do that? What is the best way to do that is what Skip was asking. We, did, we talked at length on this to, so much to where 
I asked him to give us a little video that he did. We watched that. And basically, he just asked the questions. You know, what all is the best thing to do? Should we homeschool our children? Should we um, send them to private school? Should we send them to public school? These are hard decisions for anybody to make now. But it all comes down to basically two points. And that is, one, that we are responsible for educating our children. And nobody else. A lot of people like to put that off on a school system or something. That is incorrect. That's not biblical. We are responsible for educating our children. Now, whether you choose to send them to public school, you're still, you're still ultimately responsible. If the school's not doing their job, you still have a job to do. You need to educate your children. We need to, sure, we need to be advocates. Um, and our family many times has been advocates in the public sphere to make sure that children are getting a good education. But if the public education fails, if it fails, and a lot of times it does fail, then you're still responsible. You can't blame somebody else. So you may make this, if it fails too much, you may make the decision to put your kids in private school. If that fails, you may say, hey, let's just homeschool them. There's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a hard, hard decisions. We determined that to make those kind of decisions, you need to have, definitely have time alone with God. Definitely have time alone with God so you can seek the answers. And what about the opposition part then? We know we're supposed to educate our kids. We know that God has the answer. Where does the opposition come from? Many times the opposition comes from people within your own sphere of influence. How many times have you said something like, well, I think about, you know, uh, me and uh, whatever are thinking about, me and my husband and my wife are thinking about homeschooling our kids. And somebody goes, oh, you don't want to do that. What you, that's going to take way too much of your time and blah, 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 blah. What you need to say is, get behind me, Satan. Well, maybe not say that to her face, but... <laughs> well, you could, I guess. But there's a lot of you know, people that have, want to give a lot of opinions about what you should do with your children. Those are just opinions. About as good as they're worth. Always need to seek out God's will for what to do with your children. And He will tell you. You ask Him, He will tell you. Don't listen to anybody else. Go to God for answers. There's going to be opposition. There's always opposition in life. It's difficult. Which comes to the next point, how to not have opposition in your own family. Many times opposition comes, the greatest opposition in life a lot of times comes from people in your own family. That could be from your own family, your own nuclear, your own natural family at home. It could be come from extended family. Families and problems within families can cause a lot of problems, a lot of strife, a lot of turmoil in your life from your own family. Everybody has it. Everybody has dysfunctional families. Why? Because, because you're part of it. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Take a bunch of people that are imperfect, put them in a family, you're going to have problems. Same way in a church. People like to complain about church. Say, well, this church, that, this church, that, this church, this. I'm like, well, that's just because they made up a bunch of people. If people go to church, it's going to be problems. <laughs> We're all problems. You should, though, pursue to be a peacemaker in your home. You should pursue, because there's enough Opposition and craziness outside your family and in the world that want to cause you problems. One place you really need to work on peace in your home is in your own family. The family unit that structures well together under God is an amazing force in life. It will help your kids to grow up to be well rounded individuals and know who they are. Because what have I said 10,000 times from up here? If you don't tell your children who they are, somebody will. And they will gladly do it for you. Be very warned about that. There's lots of people that Satan uses to tell your kids who they are. I see it every day. I see it in phone calls. I see it in text messages. I see people we talk to all the time. Parents saying, I don't know what I'm going to do about little Johnny. He thinks this or that. He's messed up. Now he's in jail. Now he's in prison. I didn't want him to drag him to church when he was little because he didn't want to go. We didn't, we didn't want to get up. But now somebody's making him get up, aren't they? They eat the mess hall at 7 a.m. in prison. Do it while they're young. It's difficult. Payoff is good. Pursue peace in your family. Don't live in crisis mode. This pretty much could all be found in Psalm 121. One of the greatest psalms ever. About peace and how to pursue it. Lots of families, the norm in this day and time is crisis mode. If you don't have a crisis going on all the time, you don't feel right. You've done it for so long, maybe even your parents did it. 
You live in crisis mode so long, it gets, it gets to be normal for you. And it's like, if there's not a crisis, you feel uneasy. It's a bad place to be in. You need to pray to get out of that mode and realize that God will give you peace. You don't have to have a crisis to solve every 15 minutes. It's a wonderful thing to have peace in your home. Number five, church under attack. This is one of the greatest eye-opening messages you may have ever heard. I've ever experienced myself is to look at the attack on the families to statistically there are seven statistically attack on the family statistically what does that mean so I hope anything called the fertility rate in America fertility rate in America is currently 1.7 what does that mean for every two people to have a baby there's only 1.7 people that replace them that means we're going negative. If it was 2.0, that means for every two people, we'd have two babies. Right now, we're less than that. That means if we continue on the same track we are, we're going to die out. No doubt about it. This is where I say that science and scripture a lot of times agrees. If we're not having enough babies, especially in the Christian faith, we're going to die out. Period. It's right there in the numbers. If you don't replace, you're going to die out. Amazing thing that right after I started studying this, that became a topic on the world stage, of all things. Uh, Elon Musk uh, mentioned it, and I was like, hey, Elon's read my mail. <laughs> it was really weird. I don't know why uh, all this happened at one time, but the fertility rate in America is frighteningly low. Didn't used to be that way. It used to be greater than two. That way we're always replenishing. The fertility rate in Germany is uh, 1.4. I don't know. The fertility rate in Germany is 1.4. Here's why that's important. I'm never going to say everything is not important. Fertility rate in Germany is 1.4. Why is that important? That's because the fertility rate for uh, Muslim immigrants in Germany is 7.1. For every two Muslim immigrants in Germany, they have seven children. Guess what's going to happen in our lifetime? Germany will be Muslim. Germany will be a Muslim country in our lifetime based on the current rounds. I'm sorry? That's in the news this morning. Was it really? Boom. Some guy over there speaking out about it. Oh, yeah? As these numbers become more and more aware, um, this is something that especially the um, Muslim faith has known for years. Many years ago, they, they would say things like, well, we are going to make sure that we are a Muslim country in, they would have their list within such amount of time. I did not understand. I don't think a lot of people understood what was going on. But we understand now. I was thinking, they got to go in there and take these places by force. This doesn't make any sense. They got jihad. They got 9 11 everywhere. What's going to happen? No, it's a sleeping giant in the background. They will be a Muslim nation. In Germany, and pretty much almost always already are, are really. It's a sad state of affairs there. Genesis 1:26 through 28. That's also, of course, part of the God's design for the family. But you can read more about those kinds of things about what God wants us to do. God said for reason to populate the earth. He didn't say, okay, um, create man, woman, y'all just whatever. No, God said populate the earth, multiply. He even told, he even told the, the you know, birds, animals, and all that, multiply, multiply. Be fruitful, multiply. This is what we're supposed to do. The problem is, of course, many years ago, we decided to get selfish again. And people said, well, I don't really have that many kids because I want to go work, and I want my husband to work, and I'm going to be in the workforce. We can't really handle a lot of kids. Kids that we do have, we're going to put in daycare. We're going to put them in schools. I'm going to mess with them. We don't have too many because it's going to hurt our bottom line. I don't want to be, I don't want to want for anything because when I was little, I wanted a lot. I had nine brothers and sisters. I don't want that to happen to go more. So we're going to lavish all kinds of gifts and things on our kids. We're only going to have two kids. And before too long, what happens? Fertility rate goes down. People are having kids that are selfish. And we're headed to a bad, bad future. This is what happened in America. It started in the 60s and 70s and prolific in the 80s. And now we're just now waking up and I hope it's not too late. So we we'll right from that into what can we do about some of these things. So we have what we call Adoption Sunday. 
had one of my friends do a, a very incredible testimony here about how she adopted her son. It was an incredibly moving uh, testimony of what God did in her life for her to be able to adopt and how that uh, situation is open to anybody still. There's still plenty of kids that need adopting. They need to be in loving homes, and we provided resources of how you might be able to know that and, uh, and follow that. And so we have to understand that adoption has always been in the Bible. Where is the, who, is the first, who is the first adoption that we really know of in the Bible? Moses. Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Exodus chapter 2, 5 through 10. <laughs> Exodus 2, 5 through 10, first adoption. Who's somebody else that was adopted? You know, remember? A bunch of people, but in the Bible. Another big one, Esther. Esther was adopted by Mordecai, her uncle. You can read about that actually in the book of Esther. Specifically chapter 2. We're all adopted. We're all adopted into God's kingdom. I'm not Jewish. I'm considered a Gentile. We're all adopted into God's kingdom. God grafted us in. Like you take a tree and graft in part of it and then it grows with it. You can find that in Deuteronomy 10, 18. God is a father to the fatherless. We're all adopted in. Even if you don't have a father. Had a father that was maybe abusive or something like that. God, God is your father. God is your father. Chapter 10, verse 18. Deuteronomy 10, 18. In summary, God is a father to the fatherless. Also, adoption is definitely blessed by God in the Bible. Especially even Jesus. When Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 5. Jesus said in Matthew 18, verse 5. Whoever welcomes such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. You're taking care of a child that needs, has needs. You're, you're welcoming Jesus. So that's a pretty important statement right there. So yes, adoption is a great thing that, you know, you know if you ever want to pray about that, we can pray about it with you. If you've ever considered such a thing, then um, it's, an incredible, it's an incredible experience for people that uh, can't have children or want to adopt. There's plenty of children out there that, that need adopting in our world. And it is a great, great blessing. So we talked about adoption then very timely, very timely on the next uh, Sunday within the next week. Roe versus Wade was overturned in, in America in the federal courts. So we talked about what that meant for us as Christians. Uh, so I was able to go through, and this is, in, this is a good place for this on your resources, is go to our resource list on the internet there. That there's a QR code in the uh, fellowship hall. If you want to take a picture of it, send it to our resource list. Uh, I can also include it in the next text message on the resource list. If you go to any of our uh, videos or anything like that, you'll find the resource list listed there. Because I gave you a whole bunch of scripture about abortion and about all the scripture that says it's you know it's a sin. It is no doubt about it. It's a sin. Abortion is a sin. And of what you can basically be able to talk to people if they have questions, especially kids. Because they're inundated with things like, oh, it's not a sin, it's a woman's choice, and this kind of th stuff. This is what the world wants you to believe, which is incorrect. It's a sin. Um, are people forgiven that have abortion genes? Of course. We're all forgiven for our sins if we ask God and repent. We're forgiven. It's a hard thing to go through, though. I've, I've been able to counsel several uh, females that have had uh, abortions in their lifetime. And it's an incredible freeing experience for them to hear the good news that they are forgiven. I mean, it's just it's a very emotional, uh, amazing release of emotions when uh, people realize that God has forgiven them. And it's a hard thing to, to overcome. But it, but it certainly happens. So there is a resource list um, there of abortion on on the internet for you that lists, lists a bunch of scriptures, probably 30 or 40 scriptures throughout uh, the lists. And also a great article um, on there about it as well that will give you kind of great insight 
into the whole into the whole topic. So we do as a church celebrate the overturning of anything that makes this process legal. Of course, we have a state in Kentucky that um, has some leaders that are very anti-Christian and very anti-biblical, and we have to fight those. We have to fight those things. People say, well, I don't get involved in politics or whatever, because you know, you're going to be held accountable for that. It's not politics. It's a moral law, what I'm talking about. So we do need to stand up for the rights of the unborn, and we need to tell people what the Bible says. The Bible has saving power and grace. We're not trying to argue anybody in any kind of position. It's ridiculous. What we're trying to do is show them the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let's see. Where are we at? Freedom, division, and hope. That's a pretty easy one there. Freedom, division, and hope. So we had a great speaker that day with Dennis Wallace. Told us about the uh, old uh, Ragged, old ragged flag, old rugged, ragged flag. <laughs> I can write a minute. And just a great uh, discourse on what it all took place with our flag, what the flag stands for, the people who have sacrificed their lives and families and money and time, and how we should respect it no matter what. And how this church respects America and respects our flag because we have freedom because of it. We should never take it for granted. Parallel that with we have freedom in Christ. What does it mean to have freedom in Christ? Same kind of thing. Christ sacrificed his own life to give us freedom. Freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. So that's freedom. Division. We talked about um, you're always going to have you're always going to have divisions. The great divide, of course, is Christians and non-Christians. There is going to be a difference. You've got to realize that. Like we say, you're headed somewhere different than somebody else. We're going to have division. We are not going to see people say today, I wish we could just all get along. They talk about politics and all the different things going on, people, different opinions, different political views and whatnot. Now, I wish you just all get along. Well, yeah, that would be nice, but that's not going to happen. Because if somebody comes to me and they say, well, I don't really believe Jesus is the Son of God. But we just hit a divide that we're not going to be able to, to, to patch. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus, well, the Son of God, we, we're not going to get along in that respect. I will be friendly to you. I will tell you about God's grace and mercy, what he's done for you. But if you don't accept it, we are going to have a divide. We're going to have to agree to disagree. We're not all going to get along. We are not all of this together. That is incorrect. That is a horrible phrase. I hate it. I hate people. <laughs> Call them myself. <laughs> I almost say, we are not all of this together. That is not true. Let it go, man. Yes, it would be nice if we were all of this together. We are not all of this together. We are not all going to be in this together until heaven. We are not all going to get along. It's not all peace, love, cop, caddy, puppy dogs. It's not like that. That's a lie from Satan. It's not going to happen. Can we be nice to each other? Sure. We can be nice to each other. Which in effect, I hope, is what they're saying. But we've really come with different backgrounds and we're headed somewhere different. We're not all going to get along. Should you pursue peace? Yes. Yes, the Bible says pursue peace. I'm not saying pursue division. I'm saying you have to understand that there is going to be division. But second part, freedom and vision, there's hope. Third part of that equation, there's always hope. There's always hope. You know what? I know there's always hope because I've seen people change right before my eyes. That said, one day they say, I don't believe Jesus. But before too long, they're like, they're the greatest passionate person for Jesus I've ever seen. So there's always hope because of Jesus. And the last one, fruit of the Spirit in the family is what we did last week. So that's probably not too long ago. But basically you want to, when, you, when you're headed to this land, you're headed to heaven. The F5 tornado is coming. It's urgent. You want to teach your kids these things in the Bible. And then what should be the result of doing these things? The result should be you are displaying fruit. Just like if you want a tree, and it's a fruit tree, eventually you should start seeing some fruit. If not, something's wrong. It's dying, it's got the plague, it's got something going on, didn't put enough nutrients in there, there's not enough sun. Something is wrong with this tree if it's not bearing fruit. Think of it the same way our own lives. If you're not bearing fruit, your family's not bearing fruit, there's something wrong, then you'll find out what it is. What's the fruit? The fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right, Maggie? 
Has he ever sent along with me? Good for you. What book of the Bible is that in? <laughs> Galatians. She, she knew, possibly. God, he's my book. Galatians, Ephesians, Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit, the main place the fruit of the Spirit is talked about is in Galatians. Galatians 5, um, 5.22. Shoo, preacher almost forgot. Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are love. Go ahead. Wait, wait, say, say, it, say it slow. Say it, turn, stand up and stand up, tell Jennifer back here. You got this. Right. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, <laughs> faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And last week I said there were two that I wish that weren't in there. That was patience and self-control. <laughs> Take those two out for me. I'm good. But God, God says you, got, you really got to have them all. You should exhibit these fruits. If you're doing what God wants you to do in your life, you should see these things as fruit. If you're not seeing this as a family, you're suddenly seeing your kids, not seeing your spouse, there's some nutrient missing. There's something wrong. There's something not right there. You're not pursuing God's will for your life if you're not bearing the fruit. As opposed to, and this is important too, as opposed to what? Well, then what's the other thing they talk about? About um, fruit and that kind of thing in the Bible. Spiritual gifts. People sometimes confuse the spiritual gifts with the fruit of the Spirit. And it kind of sounds the same. Spiritual gifts are like every person that comes to know Christ, God is going to impart to them at least one spiritual gift. So you may have a gift of preaching or a gift of um, prophecy, um, you know, kind of like a healing thing where you pray for people to be healed. That's listed in another place in the Bible. But don't confuse that with fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, you should exhibit them all. You just strive to exhibit them all. You're not really going to have all the uh, spiritual gifts. Maybe one, maybe two. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. We're just about done. I know we're a little bit over. Matthew 7, 15 through 20 says, look, you're going to know somebody's following Jesus because you're going to know them by their fruit. Same way in your own family, in your own life, and everything. When you're talking to somebody and you don't know whether they're saved or not, a lot of times you can, you can discern and judge by what kind of fruit they're bearing. How are they bearing fruit? If you're not seeing these things in your life, ask yourself, if you're not seeing these blessings in your life, you ask yourself, why not? What am, what am, what am, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I need to get back on track. Romans 8. Romans 8, great chapter, a lot of information in there. 6 and 7 says, well, what about non-believers? Can non-believers exhibit some of these things? Do you know, do you know non-believers? you know non-believers that are nice and kind and all that? I do. I know some non-believers that are kind, nice and all these things. They got, they got some of these things. But the Bible says, though, non-believers are an enemy to God. Ooh, that's harsh. What? God says, either with me or not with me. Yeah, you can exhibit some of these things. You can dis display some of these things. But truly, in your heart, do they have true peace and joy? No. We know without a fact that if you don't have God in your heart, not living for Him, you do not have true peace and joy in your heart, in your life. You may be a nice person. You can be a nice person, not be a Christian. But you're not going to be able to have all these fruit of the Spirit because you're not, you're not a Christian. You're not a follower of Jesus. You're not going to be able to have all these things. You may have some great traits and good attributes, but you're not going to have true peace and joy until you give your life over to Christ. All right, any questions? And that was a lot. I will try my best, other than maybe one or two questions. Everything is going to begin with what I just said. <laughs> You can always go back on, uh, the, I have a, I've made it real easy for you on YouTube, especially. If you go to Bethlehem Christian Church YouTube, um, you will find playlists. 
There is a God's Design for the Family Part 1 playlist. Every bit of this information in it. All nine studies are there. And then this one will be on there too as number 10. So you have plenty of tools for success. I'm very proud of you for studying it and writing things down. Because you know what? We're all preparing. We're all preparing. Because one day, you're going to... Got to be able to tell other people about Jesus. Got to know this as we go. To live a blessed, truly joyful life. You're going to have to know all this kind of information. You're going to have to know this information to tell your kids so, that you know, so they know how to become a Christian. And all these things are the true, true way to have experience, true joy and peace in life. Is this information that we have available to us from God. Let's pray.